Here we have a collection of Ava Leong's portraits. Basically, I chanced upon this collection of uh, uh, portraits about five, six years ago in Georgetown, in one of the antique stores. So when I look at this um, collection of portraits, it was a mixture of a young boy and a woman. And then under closer examination, I realized they are the same person. So presented with this um, collection of very intimate and personal portraits, I didn't really know what to do with it. So I started sharing with some friends and my friend from Penang managed to identify the subject. And he introduced me to Ava's lifelong friend since childhood. So the story was they met in primary school and how they discover they were the same was they saw each other drawing uh, woman dresses. So immediately they clicked. So they decided to go to photo studio to have their portrait taken. We were looking at this triptych of Ava's portrait. So this panel here was mostly collected by me about five years ago. So they were all taken from the 50s to 70s. So after getting in touch with Ava's best friend, Anita. So Anita had been feeding me with more photos of Ava, which we can see here. They are from Ava's personal album collection. So I grouped them in a way that you see the headshots and the full body, and then the shoulders and headshot over here. So from here, if you look at the earlier photo, you can still very much see Ava as a young boy, because uh, it was quite strict, I think in the past, also today, that boys are expected to only have crew cuts and keep very short hair. But I think from the late 50s and 60s, you can see that Ava started exploring more makeup. You can see he's doing painted eyebrow and starting to be more expressive with the hairdo and makeup. And slowly on, you can see that with uh, more accessories and different cultural dresses like Cheong Sam, Kabaya, a dinner gown. I think Ava was quite obsessed with having her portrait taken. But at the same time, perhaps she felt that photo studio was a place where she felt safe to be who she truly wanted to be. Hence, we have this big collection of photo because how she presented herself photographically and on a daily life basis could be very different. And also it shows that the operators of the photo studio at the time were quite friendly with people like Ava to encourage them to be themselves. She was in a female impersonator group and she was known for her belly dance. So you can see a collection of photos here. She got this voluptuous body figure, which is great for belly dancing. And later on, there was an interesting collection, a portrait of her dressing up as a bride. So we can see it from here and here. One of the portraits was given to me by Alex. Alex didn't know about Ava's history, but without knowing who she was, everyone would agree she's convincingly quite stunning and beautiful. I first listened to an audio recording of uh, Mr. Yip, who used to be the owner of Wafong Studio which was very famous um, in Georgetown from the 50s to 70s. I found this uh, audio recording from GTWHI, Georgetown World Heritage Incorporation. So they did this oral history project to archive um, <coughs> different business owners along Julia Street from the 50s to 70s. So Mr. Yip used to run a photo studio and the name is Wafung Studio, which is here. So um, it was during the time where Georgetown was one of the more important entertainment hubs in the region because we have um, big film production companies like the Shaw Brothers and Cathay. So during that time, many of the celebrity, the actors will tour around different big cities, including Georgetown was one of them. So they would do film premieres and also they would do meet and greet with the fans. 
Hence, uh, many actors will go to photo studio to have their portraits taken, to be distributed to the fans or as collectibles for the fans. So um, on this panel here, we can see all these celebrity portraits. They are all in Mr. Yip's collection. It's either given to him or you know, purchased by him through different channels. So here we can see um, Teresa Tang, which is a very famous singer from Taiwan. And also we have Fong Bo Bo, a Hong Kong act actress. Um, she used to visit Georgetown quite regularly. And then on the other side, here we have all these celebrity portraits taken by Mr. Yip himself. We have actors from Hong Kong, uh, Sam Din Ha, and then um, actors from Japan as well. So Mr. Yip is also a um, photo enthusiast. He takes a lot of photos himself outside of um, his work. He submitted this uh, piece for International Salon Award and he won the third prize. Uh, this person here is an Italian striptease artist and is quite tastefully done in this photo. And uh, so in the interview, in that recording, there's many other stories shared by Mr. Yip that give us different idea about the studio practice at the time. So there's something called the luck changing photo where the, usually by the Nyonya community, the Nyonya ladies will come in rickshaw to the studio with their bags of accessories. So once they enter the studio, they will put on all the accessory stones and everything. So they will have their photo taken, um, symbolized by the flash going off without any negative, meaning just the gesture of having their portrait taken without having the print printed in itself will cleanse all the bad energy. After having that uh, photo taken, your luck will be changed. So it's also interesting to know that Mr. Yip used to make portrait for mistresses. Um, and it usually happened in the evening where the mistresses will come to him and dress up as bride because during daytime, the wives were around. They can't do that, so they will come in the evening to dress up as the bride. At that time, in the, in the 50s and 60s, there was quite a few hotels slash brothels uh, along Julia Street. So many of the um, top lady of the evening will come to the photo studio to have their portraits taken. So <clears throat> once they get their portrait taken, this, they will be printed in cars and distributed around by the rickshaw pullers to get customers for the lady of the evening. So we can see that portraits were not just used by um, celebrity or family. There are also other currency that it comes with. It was used by, you know, lady of the evenings, prostitute and also mistresses. People give different meaning to, to the portrait making process. So what we have here is the thousand character pictures book. So what it does, basically, if you dream of anything, if you just refer to this book, and then it will translate your dream into a number which you could submit and try your luck with the lottery. So um, in this book, we managed to find quite a few entries that is photography culture related, like the photo studio and the photo of a landscape. So. Um, by having these sort of entries, it, it shows that um, photography culture has been embedded within the, um, the collective consciousness of certain demographics. On this cluster here, we have different seasonal greeting cards and also one wedding card. So these were all used, usually from the 50s to the 70s maybe a bit in the 80s, but it's slowly getting less and less popular by then. So um, on this card, you can see that um, usually people will collage their face onto a customized design prepared by the photo studio. 
So when it comes to different festivals, the photo studio will give a selection of template for people to choose from, where they can then collage their face onto the card with this auspicious word, um, word of encouragement, seasonal greetings word. So on the back, the sender will add their personal touch to them by right, scribbling a few lines of personal messages to whoever they want to send it to. So usually these cards are meant to be sent to family or friends away from home. So because Malaysia is a place with many different festivals and it's a place of festivity basically we can say that. So in one of these cards here we can see we have Selamat Hari Raya with the subject posing next to a Christmas tree which also suggests that it was a time where people were a bit more relaxed with cultural symbols. These greeting cards were not exclusive to a certain demographic and hence people were a bit more relaxed with the cultural symbols and the, <clears throat> the whole aim was to share their joy with their friends and family. So some of the greeting cards is not always individual, sometimes we pose as a family. So if we look at this one here, which is a family as a social unit with the Salamat Hari Raya greeting card and how it has uh, evolved into what we see today. Similarly, we, we still do um, seasonal greeting maybe in a slightly more different way, which is the Baju Raya Sedongdong. Now that we notice that it's a different sort of cultural phenomenon that we can observe these days on social media, whereby family would do this mini flash mob by using their smartphone where they choreograph and pose together by dressing up in a similar color code. They don't take themselves too seriously as a way to bond themselves as a family and also to share with their friends and family during Hari Raya, which is presented in the Bajiraya Sadongdong series here.